Everybody is going to burn their house today. We were given until midnight to leave. That's a quote by an Armenian resident of Kalbajar who has until Sunday evening to leave his home as part of the peace deal struck between Armenia and Azerbaijan to end the nearly two month long conflict between the two countries over the disputed Nagorno-Karabakh region. The deal is signed by Armenia and Azerbaijan as well as Russia. Through this deal, all occupied Azerbaijan territory as well as some Nagorno-Karabakh territory that was gained by Azeri forces will return to Azerbaijan's control officially. Furthermore, the deal established two corridors. One would be between Stepanakert and Armenia and another corridor between Nakhchivan and mainland Azerbaijan. 2,000 Russian peacekeepers are being deployed to guard the corridor connecting Nagorno-Karabakh to Armenia as well as to make sure that both sides stick to the deal. Sam, let's get right into this. How is this peace deal being received by Azeris and Armenians? Well, that's a very interesting question. And uh, uh, the peace deal has been received in completely opposite uh, ways, basically, in Azerbaijan and Armenia. In Azerbaijan, there were celebrations in the streets, there was jubilation all over, while in Armenia, there were protests against the uh, signing of the deal. People felt betrayed by the leadership, as well as uh, by Russia, especially. They even attacked the... Uh, uh, official buildings, governmental buildings, they took, o- they took over certain governmental buildings. So the re- popular reactions in two countries have been completely opposites. And uh, Armenians are feeling completely betrayed by Russia and their leadership, while Azeris feel like they have uh, gained back their lost territories and uh, they are celebrating at the moment. So the people are, you know, uh, completely different reactions but maybe we can get into the um, you know uh, leadership responses later on yeah but you just said something interesting here which I think I heard kind of the opposite which was that in Armenia and I was surprised to hear this for some reason at least how the reporting was being done by a few channels was that Russia wasn't perceived that badly although just like you said official officials in Armenia receiving a huge backlash but I was surprised, according to what I heard, that Russia wasn't receive, receiving so much backlash, although, of course, they're the, they're the party who put the deal together. Did you hear anything like that? Uh, in the beginning, yeah, Russian wasn't getting so much of the blame, mostly Pashinyan. But now that the deal is truly being enforced, I think uh, Russia is getting more and more of the blame. When I saw a couple of interviews with people, with residents of Karabakh or uh, areas surrounding Karabakh that they were, uh, you know, leaving, as you mentioned, some of them were burning their houses, some of them were even removing their uh, their ancestors' graves from there. And, uh, yeah, they, they seem to blame, uh, starting to blame Russia, because, you know, they saw Russia as a, you know, a more of, uh, as a protector because of the cultural as well as the religious ties, you know. Uh, but uh, yeah, you're right. Originally, it was mainly uh, Armenian leaders that got the blame. But to be honest, I uh, went and looked into it. it. Interestingly, even the people who uh, were in the leadership before Nikol Pashinyan came to power, like uh, Rob- Robert Kacharyan and Len Petrosyan, these are, I think, second and third prime ministers of Armenia, even they... Uh, made it uh, in October, I believe, they made the trip to uh, uh, Russia. They tried to mediate with Russian elite circles to get more supports, and they failed as well. These are people who were who are originally from Karabakh. They were uh, part of a party that pretty much controlled Armenia for the last 20 years. So, you know, I, I think Armenians are realizing that there was no other, without Russian support, there was no other choice for Armenia to sign the deal yeah so and just to finish up with russia here so then they kind of they're really good with both sides well not really good of course the armenians can't be too happy with them right now but the azeris i'm guessing are very happy with russia and maybe even brought them a bit closer yeah actually to be honest let's get into the russian perspective as a whole uh in russia the responses to the deal have been mixed many nationalistic writers and authors have criticized the government in newspapers, saying that while this may seem like a win at the moment, it's a a strategic loss and a prestige loss for Russia. 
But let's get into it. What do they mean by a strategic grid? Since the time of Soviet Union, this is uh, the first time that Russian troops are being deployed in the southern Caucasus. So in, in a way, Russian influence is increased. Secondly, this deal is only signed by Russia besides the two parties. Uh, and this marginalizes the other, uh, the other uh, countries within the Minsk group, which are US and France, to traditional, you know, not enemies, but opponents of uh, Russia in foreign policy. Uh, at the same time, there are not going to be any Turkish troops there, although at first Turkey seemed to have suggested that there seems to be some Turkish observers perhaps being deployed. So in a way, it could be viewed as a Russian win because Russian troops are back in within Azerbaijan and Armenian territory. Before this, there was no Russian troops in Azerbaijani territory. So in, in that way, it's a win for Russia. But many uh, nationalistic writers in Russia have criticized the deal. They say that we have lost the uh, ally for a five-year deal that uh, could, you know, could end in a, in a removal of 2,000 troops, basically, 2,000 peacekeepers. They say uh, uh, Putin is... Uh, being slightly too arrogant, he's not counting on Erdogan's uh, foreign policy, and they are saying that by allowing this win for Erdogan and other camps, they are fueling uh, Islamic extremists, and Erdogan is going to try to basically uh, recreate his success here in other Muslim majority regions, may, uh, of which Russia has many, you know, especially in northern Caucasus surrounding Caspian. So uh, in Russia, it has been a completely mixed, uh, you know, it has been received mixed because at the same time, many people see this as a complete win for Russia because Russia since 1994, basically, the, the you know, any peace deal that was, uh, the deal that happened today is pretty much what kind of should have happened and what was Russia pushing for since 1994, which is that, uh, return of surrounding areas of Karabakh to Azerbaijan, uh, guarantee for the safety of minorities in Karabakh, which are Armenians, basically, uh, minorities that would be minorities within Azerbaijan. And then um, uh, at the same time, there will be a corridor established between Karabakh and Armenia to, you know, so there is access always. So this was not a, this settlement was not a surprise settlement. And in many ways, Russia was pushing for this for the last 20 years. And it was the Armenian leaders who were basically uh, not giving any points, you know, uh, just basically killing time. And under Pashinyan, they became even more hardcore. And they started, perhaps, they started even talking about uh, officially uh, joining Republic of Arstak to Armenia. So uh, in that sense, uh, it's not clear if Russia is a winner or a loser. But it's been mixed. It's been received very in in very mixed uh, fashion in in Russia itself. Okay, but the Armenian prime minister and his government. I mean, they've received. I think a backlash would be an understatement. There were, uh, if I'm not mistaken, there were assassination reports that came out on the prime minister about two to three days ago, and apparently they were related to former officials. Would you know more about that? Yeah. Um, a few days ago, there were reports of an plot, assassination plot that was foiled by Armenian uh, police forces. Three people of uh, the uh, uh, Homeland Party, which was the party that was controlling Armenia for a long time, were arrested. One of them was the former head of the national director of the National Security uh, Council, I believe. So, uh, yeah, there are definitely tensions and there was an assassination attempt that was... Uh, foiled by the governmental forces yeah what, what so, do you think what do you think yeah. lies ahead for his administration now i think Pash, it's hard to say because uh, i think feelings in armenia in the last few days have completely changed in a way uh, like they have realized that he had no other choice to uh, sign that because in the in the day he signed the deal actually the president of armenia denied having any knowledge of the deal and said that, you know, uh, he's going to look into it and stuff. There, There is going to be 
uh, emergency meetings of the parliament. But now that I see today was, I think the tomorrow is the first day that they have to um, hand over territory and it seems that it, this is happening. When uh, when they were when the president was saying that he didn't know about the deal and all that, Turkey made threats that you know you should go through with the deal, don't break the truce. Uh, so uh, I think who knows who knows. I I do think uh, Armenia is gonna shift to a more even nationalistic mood. Armenia is gonna definitely. Uh, shift towards a more diversified foreign policy. I, I, have, I, I, I think they're going to look to China, look to Europe, look to Iran, look to everywhere, basically, to uh, basically uh, get more support because they feel betrayed by, our, uh, by Russia. And probably Joe Biden's presidency is going to be a bit of a you know, positive thing for them because right now America has its own issues with Turkey, especially the Democratic Party. And, uh, and Trump was uh, some, somewhat, not really, but somewhat of an isolationist. At least he wasn't interested in new conflicts. But I have a feeling Biden and his team would be far more imperialistic, so to speak, in their approach to foreign policy. I, and I don't mean that in a negative or positive way. It's just in a descriptive way, really. Okay, yeah, that's extremely interesting. So maybe they'll try to be less reliant on Russia as their superpower friend and try to diversify a bit their portfolio but i think just going back to the prime minister it was exactly last sunday when azerbaijan declared that they had taken over the second biggest city of the region shusha so i think after that it just seemed like i don't know from the outside it seems like a very wise and right decision that the armenian prime minister made yeah, and, and it's important to mention, it's been reported as a peace deal a lot of places. It's not a peace deal, it's an armistice, which is basically a cessation of hostilities. Uh, and Prime Minister Pashinyan did say that this is this does not mean peace. So I, I would assume in five or ten years, perhaps, we are back to cert some kind of conflict. Although uh, that was something that a lot of Russian experts have pointed out as well, that because of the oil and gas revenues that have been pouring into Azerbaijan and are expected to pour into Azerbaijan in future, it is hard to see the balance of power shift in terms of materials, military material and all that. So, you know, it's hard to see a future where Armenia would do a attack and has the upper hand. So, uh, I mean, this is a good place to get into the fact that, you know, what is happening on the ground right now in these conflicts. and. Um, there are no good guys, basically, because, you know, a lot of people, uh, even some people who commented on our videos tend to, you know, to, we, we all tend to take sides, you know, and stuff. We, we try to look for uh, patterns that we are used to from like uh, stories, movies, good guys, bad guys. But the reality is, well, very complicated. Today, for example, Kalbajar was being evacuated and Kalbajar was, uh, Kalbajar right now is... Uh, well, right, not right now, but until yesterday was exclusively populated by ethnic Armenians. But in 1990s, before the Armenians came, uh, it was almost exclusively uh, populated by ethnic Azeris. So although we all saw those sad images of Armenians leaving and, uh, you know, uh, burning their houses, leaving their belongings, all that, at the same time, uh, you know, it's hard not to see uh, Azeri's point of view uh, because they were they were forced to live in the very similar fashion. I, I mean, who knows who's exactly responsible, which government, which policymaker. But, you know, it's very much similar to the Palestinian-Israeli si situation. Uh, so you could view those Armenians as settlers that were removed, you know, and many Muslims certainly do. Uh, I mean, that's the, yeah, that's the situation on the ground. Yeah, I think I even read that some of the houses that they were burning, they actually literally belonged to Azerbaijanis before the 90s. So they left, Armenians took over, and then they burned the houses that they were leaving, or as many as the houses that were burned. And just wanted to touch on one thing you talked about, the 
imbalance of power that's going to become is going to increase between Azerbaijan and Armenia. And I think one reason perhaps countries didn't come to the rescue and might not even come to the rescue of Armenia as much as they want is the fact that, well, it's the truth, but they're not naturally, uh, naturally like resource rich country. Yeah, so yeah, I can exactly. definitely see that, you know, playing in the minds I mean, of the French, the, the Americans in the future. During the last 20 years, Azerbaijan had a foreign policy called caviar diplomacy, is commonly called that, which they have been basically wooing European officials through, they bring them to Azerbaijan, possibly there, there is corruption as well, but, you know, they give them good service, blah, blah, blah. And yeah, Azerbaijan is rich in oil, it has access to waters, you know, now it's probably, I mean, it's probably the most crucial part of this deal is getting least am amount of attention. Now, um, they are, now, first of all, Armenia has no, because there was a gas pipeline that goes through Azerbaijan and then Georgia and somehow goes through, goes to Turkey. And this pipeline, Karabakh regions and the surrounding areas were sort of overlooking that area in a way giving Armenia somewhat of a, you know, advantage if there is a, they could have attacked those, right? Now they don't have that. And not only that, now there is a corridor between Nakhchavan and the mainland Azerbaijan, which means that there could potentially be a pipeline going through Azerbaijan to Turkey uh, with no third country, with no, you know, nothing. So, uh, yeah, I, I don't see any ways for Armenia to to be honest, uh, you know, uh, who knows, who knows, maybe they get into a bigger alliance because even Georgia, which is a Christian country, does not have really good relations with Armenia. They have very, uh, very long and bitter rivalry. So, you know, uh, who knows, who knows. Yeah. And so finally, is there anything about Iran to say here? Yeah, I think we should talk about international response in general. Uh, Turkey was obviously very glad with the deal, although I think they felt somewhat cut out by Russia. And uh, they've been very bellicose, and Erdogan has been very bellicose in his congratulations and in his threats to Armenia. Iran, uh, Iran's response was very muted. They, uh, they, there were rumors that Iran's border is going to change because their road to Nakhchavan is going to be right on the border of Iran, Armenia. But Iranian officials, deputy foreign minister, they denied that. They said that Iranian borders will not change with Armenia and any road to Nakhchavan or what a corridor or whatever uh, has to go through Armenia mainland. American and European response has been completely muted, to be honest. But I saw a debate on Al Jazeera, which was interesting. There was somebody who was an official formerly employed by NATO and he said that in many ways, this is not a bad outcome. He was quite happy with a NATO member being Turkey, uh, you know, becoming more uh, powerful within the South Caucasus, an area largely within Russia's sphere of influence. So I don't think you could argue that, you know, uh, it, NATO is necessarily, or America or Europe is necessarily against this. As I mentioned, uh, Azeris also have been trying to woo Americans and Europeans. I believe even there was a time Obama team had major connections with Azerbaijan. Berzinski, a former um, national security director and security advisor to U.S. presidents who passed away a few years. Berzinski is kind of like a Kissinger, Kissinger point two oh, you know, like uh, another sort of uh, diplomat type. He, he he had certain financial interest in Azerbaijan. So, yeah, I, I, you know, I don't think this is definitely because a, a lot of newspapers have described it as a loss for France and U, U.S., but I don't think ne necessarily that's true. Um, as I mentioned, NATO response in many ways uh, uh, is a good one. Like this, this is not necessarily bad for them. And, uh, you know, uh, France is the one because of, I assume, because of the large Armenian minority that has had the most negative reaction in terms of like, and it hasn't been an official reaction, it's been more of a media reaction that, you know, they emphasize the humanitarian cost on the Armenian side. And, uh, you know, 
that makes sense. That's natural. 